Good evening and a very warm welcome. Uh, I'm David Wilson, the President of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. But this is not just a Royal Society of Edinburgh night, or indeed week, and that's really the great thing about it, because it's us in conjunction with the British Academy. And I think it's the first time that the British Academy has done this, and that is take a, a complete week-long series of events uh, and hold it uh, outside London. And we here in Edinburgh are enormously pleased that we're the experimental plot, as it were, uh, to see how it works. And you, the audience, will be able to tell us, I don't know how many days you'll all turn up for, but you'll be able to tell us if, if, it, if it works or not. I'm under very, very strict instructions for people who haven't been at the Royal Society before to say we assume that you're literate people and you've read that, so that's what happens when there's a fire. You'll know all about it and we just go across the street and it'll be jolly cold and we'll stand outside the George Hotel until it's over. Uh, much more important though, please, and this really does matter, please would you switch off mobile phones. I know it's a medievalist audience, but even medievalists probably have mobile phones. So if you wouldn't mind switching them off. Um, the first part of, of this evening is going to be slightly stranger than the, the yeah. program in that, sadly, uh, Rosemary Cramp, who was going to be speaking, has been taken ill very sadly and, and, and very suddenly, and she, she, li she lives in Durham, so there's no question of her even trying to get here. She shouldn't try to do so. Um, and I'm sorry about that disappointment. But the great thing is that... Barbara Crawford um, is going to do a double act. She's going to be uh, Rosemary Cramp, and then she's going to be herself. Um, and that will enable us to have a very good discussion. Because <laughs> Ro Rosemary Cramp has very kindly said, given the, the talk, the, the notes, and, and the, and the il illustrations which she was going to use, and Barbara, Barbara Crawford will use those. And then what we thought we would do in discussing this, that we would finish that, that would be the lecture that... Uh, Rosemary Cram would have given, and then we will go over to what would have been the question and answer session, and what I'll do is ask Barbara Crawford if she's got any comments on herself, what she just said, <laughs> uh, in which case we'll have those comments, and then what I'd like to try to do would be not just sort of question and answer, as it were, but to draw on the wisdom and the knowledge of the audience to have more of a discussion, if we can. So instead of those usual crisp instructions that please keep your questions short, say who you are and don't go on for too long, it will allow people to go on for a wee bit longer. And if they have comments on what being said, then, then we'd welcome it and we'll try to do it as, as, as a discussion. So luckily we have Barbara Crawford with us, who is Honorary Reader in History at the University of St. Andrews. Research interests, you probably all know this, uh, encompass the medieval Norse earldom of Orkney and the Viking settlement archaeology of Scotland, uh, with a recent diversion, as it's called, into the cult of St. Clement of Rome in England and in Scandinavia. And, Barbara, if you would take on at least one of your roles and then the other part of your role, that would be very nice indeed. Thank you. Well, my notes seem to have disappeared, which is rather annoying. <laughs> No, that's not them. What? No, it was a bigger file altogether. <laughs> they were sitting here. What have I done with them? I left them here. Oh, yes, that's yes, Thank you very much. <laughs> that was a good start to the evening. <laughs> Full of surprises. Well, President, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to start this evening's events off by acting on behalf of our first speaker, Professor Rosemary Cramp, and this precedes the main lecture of the evening, the rally lecture on portable Christianity, to be delivered by Professor Julia Smith, the Edwards Professor of Medieval History at the University of Glasgow. There are two interlinked themes about the importance of monuments, some portable and some more firmly fixed in or near the place where they were erected but both of which are exceedingly important to us as historians, art historians, archaeologists, theologians, and students of religion for our understanding of society in the Middle Ages, especially the early Middle Ages. The program is so rearranged um, that I will set the scene with um, Professor Cramp's thoughts on the matter of stone monuments and followed by my own thoughts on another type of stone monument 
and you will then be invited to join in with your own questions and observations. Now, I must say, of course, that Professor Cramp is one of the foremost um, experts on Anglo-Saxon stone monuments in, in the British Isles, and she is an archaeologist and the professor, she was, the, she's the Mentors Professor in the Department of Archaeology at the University of Durham, where she built up that department through the 1970s and 1980s, so that it was a foremost centre for the teaching of archaeology, and particularly for teaching and research of the Anglo-Saxons. And during that period, she worked on many ecclesiastical sites, led the important excavations at the famous sites of Jarrow and Wearmouth, as well as at other secular settlements in Northumbria. And she was and is coordinator of the Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Stone Sculpture, a series covering England and published by the British Academy. She is the author and co-author of three of those volumes. So nobody has more knowledge and understanding of Anglo-Saxon sculpture than Professor Cramp. And I'm just very sorry, of course, she's not here to present it with her talk with her usual verve and um, assurance and interest. But I will do my best with her notes and with her PowerPoint. The PowerPoint presentation arrived at 4.30 this afternoon, so I've only had a brief look at the illustrations, although I did have the text of her talk um, for a few days. So um, I will follow on from Professor Cramp then with my brief introduction to the hogback stones, which are a very different form of monument from the Anglo-Saxon ones and associated with the Vikings. Perhaps we could have the lights down, could we? Thank you. Monuments in motion. In choosing to discuss early medieval Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Scandinavian monuments at the beginning of the medieval week, Professor Cramp says, we were conscious that we are providing a curtain raiser for the main topic of the day, a study of very portable objects, medieval relics, within their religious and social contexts. Monuments then might seem at first sight the very opposite type of artefact. They are, we tend to think, rooted, immobile, and set up to make an impact in a specific place. In our conversation, we hope to demonstrate that although the group we have selected from the Christian monuments of Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Scandinavian England, with relationships in southern Scotland, often have these qualities, recent debate has set in motion new ways of considering them. They are often now seen as possessing a fluidity of meaning and context, and even as objects which have a life of their own, not just as reflecting our changing attitudes to them. In postmodernist study of the cognitive life of things, they are seen as accumulating biographies, and to quote, as things in motion. This is perhaps a point we can try and um, explore and enlarge on later. I will consider in this brief discussion the possible reasons for construction and location, how these monuments functioned in their time, their meaning to contemporary and later viewers. Christian monuments of the 7th to 11th centuries are unique to Britain and Ireland, and they exist in large numbers. The regional publications of the British Academy Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Sculpture has immeasurably augmented the numbers of such monuments, which exist in thousands, many now fragmentary, hidden in later church walls or in graveyards, or broken up as rubble by later generations. Recently, indeed, the very purpose of their later reuse has become a matter of debate. Was this a rejection of the past or a desire to encapsulate it? However viewed, the achievement of their production was huge. This was a people, sorry, I'll start again. Yet, however viewed, the achievement in their production was huge. This was a people whose art had been Picasso-like in its fragmentation of the human form and reformation into puzzling combinations of human and bird or animal elements. And this is reflected mainly in the personal and portable objects in fine metalwork, which as migratory people they prized. This is why we have a first image of the portable objects of the period in fine metalwork, some of which you will recognise, one of which I recognise, which is the Sutton Hoo Great Belt Buckle. 
We should note that the special interest in animal forms and interconnection of the human and animal world persist, persists throughout this period. Yet in about three generations after acceptance of Christianity, the Anglo-Saxons had started to produce stone sculptures with classical and elegant figures and inventive and varied animal, vegetal, vegetal, vegetable. Hmm? She's written vegetal. <laughs> vegetable, I think. Or well, maybe it is vegetal. It is. Oh, thank you. <laughs> An abstract ornament unsurpassed anywhere in Europe. Crosses figured largely in early Anglo-Saxon conversion. Augustine arrived in Kent bearing a processional silver cross and icon with the figure of our Lord on a board. Paulinus, the first missionary to Northumbria, brought, as Bede tells us, great gold, a great gold altar cross. In the countryside, wooden crosses were set up as commemorative monuments, like King Oswald did before his victory at Heavenfield near Hexham in Northumberland, but of course these wooden crosses have not survived. Significantly, crosses were often called a Siegerbecken, a distinctive sign of victory, as on the Bucastle cross, which we will be discussing later. And it is of considerable interest that in the recently discovered gold hoard from Staffordshire, there was a processional cross which could have been carried into battle. And perhaps I can give a plug for the Society of Antiquaries lecture next week, which is going to be given by Dr. Gareth Williams from the British Museum's Department of Coin and Medals on the Staffordshire Hoard here on Monday evening. Although both wood and metal crosses may have served as inspiration for the stone, it's most likely that it was the introduction of stone architecture with the accompanying masonry skills in the late 7th century at monastic sites in Northumbria like Hexham and Wearmouth Jarrow, which inspired, amongst these wood-using peoples, elaborate stone monuments. And here is obviously a map of the monastic sites and episcopal sites in Northumbria. Books, ivories, icons and reliquaries, as well as altar crosses, which were imported into the country to enhance the new churches, provided new artistic models, as we see from the images here. Travel to the continent, and especially to Rome, opened the eyes of some of the clerics to the legacy of the Roman world in their homeland, a legacy which before would probably have been seen as largely irrelevant. I have suggested elsewhere that the Anglo-Saxons learnt techniques from Roman buildings, but they may have been influenced from the many Roman monuments that still littered the countryside. And these are Roman monuments from Scotland, um, I think one is the Bridgeness um, milestone, altar slab. But anyway, they are Roman monuments from, I think, most from the Antonine Wall area. How did the Anglo Saxons view such monuments? Some may have been recognised as pagan gods, Mithras, others could have been benignly interpreted, such as winged Niki and angels. There is, though, a difference. The Romans commemorated individuals and their families, as we can see here from the figures on the two figures on the right hand side of the screen. With one possible exception, no secular figures are depicted on Anglo Saxon monuments until the ninth century, and then mainly on Viking monuments. The earliest Anglo Saxon crosses depicted only biblical figures, including one female, the Virgin, of course, or just the cross itself enhanced with abstract decoration. What was the function of these Anglo-Saxon monuments? And here we have the two, two views of the Bucastle Cross from Northumberland. One often quoted derives from the, the account, or one often quoted function derives from the account of Willibald's life, born around 700. It is the custom, I am quoting, of the Saxon race on many of the estates of nobles and good men to have not a church but the standard of the Holy Cross dedicated to our Lord and reverenced with great honour erected in some prominent place for the convenience of those who wish daily to pray before it. Not necessarily stone. As foci for prayer and devotion and indeed for theological instruction and conversion Scholars have suggested that some could have played a part in the actual liturgy. 
Many were commemorative, as inscriptions show, and circa 700, there are also several references to the production of stone crosses as memorials for holy men, but none seem to depict the person commemorated. Some, even with religious figures, may have been seen as the statement of territorial power of st or status of those who raised them or could have been expressing several messages. Support for one function does not rule out another, but the sighting of the high crosses might be indicative. I think it is clear that the resources to design and produce such monuments as this must lie in the monasteries, but the sites on which they were raised are not necessarily monasteries themselves, as was once widely supposed. I will take as a demonstration of some of these ideas the Bewcastle Cross, and I'm sorry, it's in Cumbria, not Northumbria. Sited in a Roman fort, which was itself located in the shrine of the native god Cocidius, the Farnum Cocidii in Latin, and lying on an important route. Here the Romans had made a statement of their power, and here the Anglo-Saxons chose to show theirs in a liminal position on the borders of the British kingdoms. This position for the most finely carved crosses on borders is found elsewhere as for instance at Abercorn and Abelady on the Northumbrian border with the Picts, or the Peak District crosses on the border between Northumbria and Mercia to the south. It was also possible also at Bewcastle that there had been a revival of an earlier sacred site amongst the, the Anglo-British community before the Christian presence. The inscription in native Germanic runes, which you can see on the centre of that cross, and perhaps a little more easily um, the lower part of this left-hand um, picture. Um, the inscription in native Germanic runes is difficult to read, but this is called the Siegerbecken, the sign of victory, and it seems to be commemorative of an individual put up by a group of people, possibly as a memorial for a king, and there's a question mark with the name Alchfrith, in brackets. On the main west face there is John the Baptist <coughs> back to that one. Um, John the Baptist at the top, Christ the Judge in the middle, standing on two animals, and below, half turned with an eagle, John the Evangelist. And um, that's an enlarged picture on the left here of that lower image of um, John the Evangelist with an eagle. But, Professor Cramp says, um, or is this something unique? Might this be the figure of a ruler holding a bird as on early Anglo-Saxon coins? I have myself, she says, swithered in between whether it's the one or the other. And I've also suggested for figures elsewhere that fully front-facing figures were holy and biblical, whereas sideways-facing ones could be secular. Some have also disputed the identity of the top figure, God the Father or John the Baptist, but it seems that the latter is the most acceptable. But here, she says, is a good example of how we see what we know. In 18th century drawings, as we can see on the right, on the left side of the screen, um, these uh, 18th century drawings understood the inscription, but they did not understand the interlace and they depicted the Baptist and the Lamb in the better known image of Virgin and the Child. There are other panels of plant scrolls evoking the true vine, the symbol of the Eucharist, inhabited scrolls with little native birds and beasts, quadrupeds, bipeds and birds. In fact, she says, this could be the mustard seed on which all creatures are nourished. Interlacers are not Roman but derived from the geometric art of the Hiberno-Saxon world constructed on a grid. And Hiberno-Saxon and manuscripts, of course, include this too, and the central manuscript, um, I think, is of the Lindisfarne Gospels. Note the sundial. Now, I think we saw the sundial. No, must be further on. Yes, there we can see the um, sundial just um, in, the, in the middle of the um, interlace, um, uh, uh, vine scroll there 
is it vine scroll? No, I don't think it is vine scroll. <laughs> um, anyway, the, uh, we can see the um, uh, sundial, which is the earliest post-Roman sundial, not only in England, but possibly in Europe. Very rare indeed at this time. For that reason, this can possibly be interpreted as a monastic site because of the need, of course, for the um, times of the day for the monastic hours. But the cross as a whole, was this commemorating where Altschrift died and was buried, or was he the founder of a monastery? Well, she just leaves those as two possible possibles and question, with a question mark. The dominant figure of Christ as a judge shows how this iconic figure is dressed in classical pallia and tunica, and how it's repeated not far away in the most complex of all Anglo-Saxon monuments, the Rothwell Cross in Dumfries, which is on the right. So turning to the Rothwell Cross now from Bewcastle, the nature of the site where this cross was found is uncertain. But what is not uncertain is that Rothwell is more densely packed with theological information than any other surviving Anglo-Saxon monument. Two broad faces with figures and explanatory Latin inscriptions, narrow faces with inhabited plant scrolls like Bewcastle, but surrounded by an Anglo-Saxon poem on the crucifixion written in runes. It's the product of a learned mind, an open-air iconostasis that has provoked an enormous amount of commentary, some of it heated, in the conflicting interpretations of its function, use and meaning. I have no time here, she says, to rehearse all the ways in which the images have been linked together. The desert theme, the Eucharist, the recognition of the divinity of Christ and salvation, reconciliation through the common link of monasticism. Two images are the same as Bewcastle, um, and this is unique in, yes, these are the two images, um, at Bewcastle and at Ruthwell. Um, in which Christ is shown as standing on two beasts' heads, which you can, um, I hope, see. And this is rather unusual and I think possibly very difficult to interpret. And then her notes go into rather shorthand form. And <laughs> um, Habakkuk is mentioned, and the significance of the canticle Amon, whether that's Amon or Carrigan who's being referred to, or whether there is a canticle Amon, I, I'm not very sure. But anyway, she says, note the significance of the beasts, John the Baptist and Sergian reforms, and John the Archcantor at Wearmouth and Jarrow. I know there is a lot behind all that, those um, elements, because we did have Eamon O'Carrigan lecturing to the Society of Antiquaries last year, and many of these points were mentioned. She then says, O'Carrigan's interpretation of Ruffle as a monument which played an active part in the liturgy and reflected the liturgical reforms of Rome has been questioned in its detail, but his work provoked a greater understanding of the potential layers of meaning of the scenes on this monument. It's difficult not to believe that it was intended to be appreciated by a learned audience. But then, she says, uh, it's unlikely that a medieval viewer ever stood next to a stone cross with a copy of Bede's exegetical works in hand <laughs> to interpret the figures and the scenes. Although the scenes and the texts could have been interpreted by um, a savant to a clerical or lay audience, but the modern scholar's linking of a reading in a patristic or early medieval text with the supposed meaning of the visual image, whilst opening up the mindset of the past, can never provide an indubitable equivalence. I think there's a big warning there um, about um, equivocating um, the visual image with what we understand from early Christian texts. Such crosses, though, could be a theological teaching tool. And for some listeners, the message was probably much more simple than for others. Bede's often quoted endorsement of Pope Gregory the Great's support for the use of images for the inspiration of the unlettered, and Bede's own description of the icons in his own church, where even the unlearned could be moved by the lovable face of Christ, have a relevance here. And it is worth stressing how influential the paintings brought by Benedict Biscop, founder of Wearmouth Jarrow, seem to have been. Well-known comparisons between the um, 
the figures of Christ as judge and Christ on the Cuthbert coffin from Lindisfarne, which of course is the drawing on the right which many of you will have seen in the treasury in Durham Cathedral. I should remark also that contact with early Christian art inspired new iconography from the Anglo-Saxons themselves. The adoring beasts are not from a classical model. As in the poem, I think this is the poem on the Ruffle Cross, nature recognized the divinity of Christ and adored him. The beasts are converted from adversaries to acolytes. And she mentions Paul and Anthony as the first monks who are shown here uniquely with the cofracto of the mass, but actually I don't think there's a picture of that. These monuments are not typical. Many are much simpler, and there are changes of style, both regional and temporal. In Yorkshire in the late 8th century, a stone at Dewsbury shows eucharistic loaves and fishes and water into wine, and that must be the image on the right, I guess. Um, but it's a columnar monument, she says. That's a new Romanizing influence. And then Otley, um, which is the stone on the left, uh, shows the evangelists under honorific arches. Another um, famous and remarkable stone is from Easby, where Christ and the Twelve Apostles are a common theme, but in a different style. Most crosses, though, were decorated with abstract ornament. When painted, and all were, they could have resembled the great gold altar crosses, and indeed carved to look like them, the ones mentioned at the beginning. The intricate interlaces, with their hidden crosses embedded, which appeal to the riddling minds of the Anglo-Saxons, are very much a feature of Northumbria and Mercia, though not of Wessex. Uh, I have mentioned the persistence of animal ornament, the intertwined beasts, and, and she mentions Colerne and Ramsbury, which I assume are the, where these stones come from, and those are, I, I think, are, are in Wessex and not in North England. Um, it has been suggested that some of these could be monuments on secular estates or commemorating the secular elite. Then she draws um, to a conclusion by saying that in the ninth century, a new force of largely pagan people entered England and in this land full of monuments made their own contribution. It is still debatable whether some secular figures such as Erswick, well I think one of these must be Erswick actually, I'm sorry to be so um, uh, unable to tell you exactly, or the in, uh, it is still debatable whether some secular figures such as Erswick or the interlaced beasts were a precursor or a response to Viking art. There is, though, a new movement towards secular imagery and a shift to small regional workshops. But mo those monuments now reflected Scandi but how monuments now reflected Scandinavian beliefs is Barbara Crawford's story. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm sorry I wasn't very um, fluent in, in um, linking up the text with some of the images, but um, I hope those images did um, give a good impression of the remarkable quality of this Anglo-Saxon sculpture. And of course, Bucastle and Rothwell are some of the finest examples of any Anglo-Saxon sculpture, uh, sculpture in the whole of um, Northumbria or England. So, yes, that is her last image which is showing um, some of the newer um, pictures, the secular imagery of um, stones which are thought to be um, produced uh, as a result of a Viking settlement. And the one on the right, um, I do know, comes from Middleton in North Yorkshire and is famous for showing the warrior um, um, possibly sitting or possibly um, lying in his grave, nobody is quite certain, but anyway, equipped with all his, um, his weapons. And that is totally new in ninth century England. So I'm going to now add a, a something of an appendix to Professor Cramp's presentation um, of the Anglo-Saxon monuments in motion, and to bring into focus this very different sort of monument from the early medieval period, which um, appears in Northumbria, in the Northumbrian countryside, and in, in, in York also, 
Um, but from a, a later date. We're now into the 10th and 11th centuries, so from a time when the structure of the Anglo-Saxon church has um, in many respects been destroyed and a new elite of Scandinavian extraction has moved into Northumbrian society. Well, these are the Vikings, or the more settled descendants of the Vikings, and the monuments they are believed to have created were the so-called hogback stones. And here is um, a drawing of some of the types of hogback stones which are found, um, these, in, in northern England, in Northumbria, um, drawn by um, James Lang, who was the first person to really analyse these stones in, in any detail. So the term hogback is given to these strange stone tomb covers which are thought to have lain over the burial place of someone of Scandinavian affiliation, either Danes or Norwegians, who settled all over Northumbria, Cumbria and southern Scotland and whose um, presence we know about um, otherwise from the evidence of place names. These stones are grave covers carved in the shape of a wooden house with a curved roof line some of which have bears or other animals um, at either end, um, uh, they're called, usually called the end beasts, uh, and their significance as guardians or bearers is not um, fully understood. This is a distribution map of similar area um, of Northumbria, and the hatched areas show where clusters of these stones have been found in um, England. I, uh, this map was prepared actually uh, for, to show the English hogback distribution. Um, we'll see the Scottish ones in, in a moment. So you can see they are scattered over um, Yorkshire, Cumbria and Lancashire and there are more than are shown on this map. There are others for instance in, in the Wirral, um, the peninsula of the Wirral, but this is the areas of, of the uh, greatest concentration. And all of these stones have been found in Christian churchyards, so the presumption is that those who were buried under these stones were nominal Christians. In northern England, it's thought that some of them were linked in with the Scandinavian Kingdom of York. Perhaps they were um, the result of settlement in the countryside around York. York, of course, was the centre of a Viking kingdom, and when the uh, Vikings did settle down um, after... Uh, in, the, in the 9th century and then later in the 10th century after York was taken back by the kings of Wessex um, it may be that they uh, developed this monument this different particular monument for that, the class of people who were perhaps warriors or perhaps merchants we just don't know but who certainly expended their wealth on commissioning the carving of this type of grave slab for themselves and of course um, stones like these are uh, and were um, expensive items to expend your money on. These are the famous ones at Brompton in North Yorkshire. And I, I put this in first to show the remarkable conjunction of these stones with, uh, in a Christian setting. Um, York was not the centre for a carving of these stones, as far as we know from the surviving evidence, because the finest examples are to be found um, in North Yorkshire, near Brompton, and Sockburn, which is actually across the River Tees. Brompton is a rather insignificant place today. I hope nobody here comes from Brompton. But it gives no evidence that it must have been the centre of a powerful Scandinavian dynasty with the wealth to commission these tombs for its family or following. But that is what these magnificent series of hogback tombs suggest. If we take a closer look, you can see the extraordinary nature of the carving. I should say that 11 such stones were found, not all as well preserved as this, but 11 such hogback uh, monuments were found when the church was restored in the 1860s. They had been buried when the church had been rebuilt in the Middle Ages, um, obviously considered to be um, disreputable and not um, suitable for a Christian church at that time. Um, but fortunately, some of them were, were not hacked around too much. Very often, hogback stones are, are quite badly hacked about. But these three are, are perhaps the finest surviving examples. And you can see the exceptional quality of the carving. These bears at the end are carved in the round. That is three-dimensional sculpture, which is virtually unknown in this period, and a total contrast with the um, Anglo-Saxon sculpture, which we have just been looking at, which is not in the round, although on Ruthwell and Bewcastle, the figures are, are 
stand out from the from the um, car background carving. But these stones are quite extraordinary. Surely they are drawn from life. But what do they signify? Well, before we say try and say anything more about the bears, I'll have a look at the meaning of the house-shaped building and perhaps its religious affiliations. Well, this is what a reconstructed Viking house in western Norway has been, um, has been constructed to look like, and you'll see that the hogback roof is um, really very similar indeed to the curved roof of those hogback stones. That's what the name hogback means. And then, of course, there is the tegulation, the shingling with the tiles, which is also um, very evident on the hogback stones, and sometimes with the more um, debased type of hogback stones, it's often only the tegulation which um, survives clearly. Now, tombstones evoking a house of the dead are a feature common to many periods and cultures. This is not a very good um, picture, but it's a picture of a uh, Roman sarcophagus um, which is in the, in the shape of a large house, and it's well known that this is a feature common to many periods and cultures. It's also um, an image which is associated with reliquaries, and um, as a small house containing um, the relics of a saint or holy person, and we'll be hearing, of course, more about this from Professor Smith later on. Um, this is a fa the famous image from the Bayeux Tapestry where um, King Harold, well, he was Earl Harold at the time, was um, stretching his hands out to take his oath to Duke William um, in Normandy in 1064, and you're going to see this um, image again in the later lecture. Here is a, a, a reliquary with a roof shape rather similar to those hogback stones. And indeed, some of the most um, authoritative commentators on hogback stones believe that they are derived from portable reliquaries rather than from domestic architecture. Well, now we'll move to Scotland for you to see the places where hogbacks of this kind or perhaps not quite of the Brompton kind, but certainly hogbacks of a kind, are distributed um, in the central lowlands and the borders and a few up the east coast. And there are one or two outliers in the Northern Isles, but nowhere else, and then in the southwest at Annan and Moss now, but nowhere else in Scotland at all. It is a very um, confined area. Many of the, as I said, many of these hogback tombs in um, Scotland are rather different um, none of them have bears quite like the Brompton examples, although many of them do have end beasts. And this is one of the earliest that's been dated to the 10th century, and one of the most interesting from historical evidence. It's the stone from the island of Inchcombe in the Firth of Forth, a place of religious importance long before the medieval priory was built there in the 13th century. So this grave slab, with its Scandinavian association, gives us an indication that peoples who chose such grave covers because of family or ethnic reasons also chose to be buried on an island which was a Christian centre and in an area which was central to their own sphere of operations along the most important waterway of eastern Scotland. Now this, I think, can introduce the idea of the mobility, mobility of these peoples um, as warrior merchants or as a defensive elite. Um, we can't define who these peoples were exactly, but it's possible that they were actually being employed by the kings of Alba in the 10th century to protect the coasts and waterways. They are not the Vikings of the 9th century style. They are the later um, descendants who were perhaps um, more peaceable or perhaps not coming to attack the Kingdom of Scotland, but were actually being used by the kings to um, as, as defenders of their realm, but this is all in the area of speculation. This Inchcombe tomb has got end beasts, but they are hardly recognisable. It's very, very worn because it was, it, it actually was kept outside. It was, it's recorded in 16th, uh, 16th century sources sitting outside, so it has suffered severely from um, weather damage. Then along the most important waterway of Western Scotland, there's a remarkable sequence of hogbacks in the church at Govan. There are five of them, and they are the biggest and most massive examples of the type, ranging from 2 metres to 2.4 metres in length. They are also a very singular style, and a few of them have got end animals. You can just um, make out end animals here, um, but they're not very uh, clear. 
and some of them may have been recut as well. These must be the monuments of a ruling elite. But for whom were they prepared? If they are the second half of the 10th century in date, as they have been dated, then they might be linked with the expulsion of the Norse dynasty from York after 954. And I have suggested uh, that members of this family and ruling elite might have sought refuge in the kingdom of Strathclyde. But again, that's pure hypothesis. However, I think it does perhaps evoke the mobility of this Hogback monument, which people in motion took um, with them when they moved into another political and cultural environment. Well, i better move on to the bears, because I think we're running out of time. The conversation is going to be <laughs> reduced um, if I don't get to the end. So just to finish up with a, a closer look at the bears and a few thoughts about these bears, back to Brompton. Um, these are brown bears, which roamed the woods of northern Europe and still do, although it's unlikely they were still around in the British Isles in the 10th century. But they were certainly familiar to northern peoples as elements of pagan warrior mythology. Bears were symbols of bravery and ferocity, and they are certainly part of the animal repertoire of other early medieval peoples, including the Picts. But on the hogbacks here, they are in some way intimately linked to the house of the dead, or the reliquary. So what role were they performing? Was it a protective role? What is the significance of them being muzzled? Does this indicate, or I'll go back to that, because you can see the muzzles um, around, around the, um, the bear's jaws here. Does this muzzling indicate that the bears had been tamed in the service of Christianity? And can this be any indication of the Christian or partial Christian status of the dead warrior? Well, in the wider Viking thought world, the bear was directly associated with the gods, and particularly with Odin, the god of battle, one of whose names was Björn. And Odin is depicted on some of the carved stones in the Scandinavian colonies around the British Isles. We know that the berserks were associated with Odin-related warrior cults, and the obvious meaning of the term berserker is bear shirt, probably because they assumed bearish attributes and also donned bear skins in battle. And this metal plaque from Oland shows it's a pre-Viking image of um, a man fighting two bears. But we have to note that these hogbacks, as said, are all from Christian graveyards, so the images are unlikely to be overtly pagan. And indeed, as some of them show, there's a very definite Christian influence being brought to bear on them, as this one at Gosforth um, in Cumbria, where we have the figure of Christ carved on one of the end of the hogback tombs. So the hogback bears are a striking reminder of a phase in the Viking saga when the pagan world was still very real and very threatening. Um, and it gives us a glimpse of the Viking thought world in which animals played a large part, as they did in other early medieval societies. But I think I should just end up by saying that the hogback tombs give us dramatic images of people on the move and taking their thought world with them. The bears signify that beliefs were on the move too, from an Odinic image taken by the Vikings with them, and which then became in some way associated with the houses of the dead, a very powerful image for the families of Scandinavian incomers into Northumbrian and early Scottish society, and one which we can still marvel at today. Thank you. That was a double tour de force. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it doesn't leave, as you were saying, an enormous amount of time um, for a, a, a long discussion. So despite what I said at the beginning, I think I'll have to revise that and say, could you actually keep your questions very short? Um, and we'll try to get through some questions. May I also say to those in the overflow, who I hope can hear this and even see it, if you want to ask a question, do come to the door, because then, 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 then I can see you. But because we have a, a, another lecture the next bit of the evening coming up at 7 o'clock, we will have to be fairly brief, I'm afraid. Do you want to say anything else about your song, which you were going to have after the lecture, or do you feel you've sung? I think I've sung enough, actually. I think it would be very good to hear comments and ideas from the audience. Right. Let's do that. Yes. 
Uh, just wait one second, sorry, I should have said there'll be a microphone, we'll come around. Just say, say if you can, who you are and where you come from, My if that's helpful. My name is Jill Duchess of Hamilton, and I've been studying early Christianity, but not in England so much. But I was very surprised that you referred to a cross being a late figure. I mean, that it wasn't, that they hadn't found it till the 8th or 9th century, because surely in Rome, after Constantine, it became quite common. By the time of Gala Placidia, you've got the cross in many, many places and on lots of coins. And that's in the 4th, 5th century. So surely it would have been here earlier than that? I don't think I said, or maybe I, I wasn't reading Professor Cramp's paper very clearly, but I don't think she says the cross is late. No, no, I don't think that's what um, she intended. Was so that? when was the first cross here? Uh, stone, cro stone, stone cross. Stone cross, yes. Seventh century. Yeah, that, that's what I thought was, seemed very late. That's what I thought. So late? Yes. Well, that's, <laughs> that's quite early for Anglo-Saxon. I mean, they were only converted in the sixth century. Yeah, but I would have thought the cross would have come with it. That was all. Well, yeah, of course it but did. I mean, yeah. as as she quoted, um, with Augustine bringing the symbol yeah. and Paulinus yeah. too. Um, but dating the crosses of the standing stone cross, of course, is very difficult. And yes. maybe the earliest ones haven't survived. But I mean, as far as I understand, these the earliest ones are seventh century. Right. Can anybody else? Any other comment? comments? Anybody got the answer to that? We got an expert in the audience. Yes, right, right, right in, right in the middle. The, the. Thank you very much. Sorry, my name is Louise Azy, and I just finished a doctorate at the University of York. Um, I, I don't want to interpret what Professor Cramp says, but I think she means that stone crosses are unique in Anglo-Saxon sculpture. Like this, this early in the seventh century, they do not appear anywhere else, and there's not like um, self-standing stone crosses, but at um, Wearmouth, there's an incised cross um, on a on a slab, mm. which is not three-dimensional, but mm. and that's um, six seventy-four. Mm. So that's kind of as as early as we can get. So that's an inscribed. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes. But not a high cross. No, no. But high crosses are unique of mm. Anglo-Saxon England in this mm. in this context. So, mm. as long as I mean, even they don't appear this kind of, they don't seem so early to us. They are quite because they're unique, and they appear only then. Is is I think is quite is quite early actually. It's not. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, other other questions, comments, please. Yeah, uh, the, I think the third row from the second or third row from the back in the middle. Um, hi, my name is Deborah Riley. I'm just interested in Vikings in Russia, and I wondered if any of these um, hogbacks have been found in anywhere but England and Scotland. Not in Russia, as far oh, as I'm aware. Okay. I mean, there are there's, there are none in Scandinavia either. There are what is called coped monuments, which are something slightly similar, but there's nothing like these hogback tombs anywhere else but in England and northern England and southern Scotland. Thank you. Other other questions or comments? Yes, second second row. Somebody, could, if you could just come around here. Yeah. Jen. Just one, one second, we'll people at the back would hear better if you have the microphone. Roger Mercer, I'm a, a prehistorian, so I know nothing about this period whatsoever, but I'm fascinated um, by the, 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 the business of the crosses being manufactured at centres which are at some distance from their current location. Um, and indeed, um, I wondered, in addition to that, whether any work has been done upon the source of the stone from which the crosses are manufactured, and whether from that, in connection with and uh, conjunction with a knowledge of the Roman road system, one can work out something of the biography of these crosses and their motion mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of their arriving at the destinations where they now subsist. Mm -hmm. I'm sure work has been done on this, but I don't know too much about it. But I think there are people here who probably do know more Some, about it. Yes, can I round on, on right on, on yes. my right, um, about a third of the way down. A microphone's just coming to you. Um, I, the only example I can mention really is at Bewcastle where I know that just above the site where the cross is, 
Sorry, I'm Susan Mills. I used to run Beats World at Jarrow, so that's why I'm an early medievalist by background. Um, and on just above there, about, I think probably about a mile away, is a quarry, the remains of the quarry, and there is actually a cross hacked out of the rock face, which was never moved down from the site. So uh, that's at least one example where, in fact, the stone hadn't been moved from very far away at all from its source. But I. I know, I think um, in the corpus of, of Anglo-Saxon sculpture, the sources of the stone, uh, the types of stone have certainly been analysed, but I'm not sure, how, I can't remember how much other work's been done, but I suspect they weren't necessarily ever moved from very far away from their, their source, actually. Mm. Although I think the hogbacks, some of the hogbacks, um, uh, Richard Bailey thinks were moved from Cumbria, from Galloway to... Um, the Wirral, I think this, he, he mentions the possibility of them being transported by boat anyway. The stone, I think, has shows that it's come quite a distance. But that's the hogbacks. Thank you very much. I think we can take one, one more, and this really ha will have to be a short question or comment, and then we'll have to break. Yes, right, right at the back. That's it, thank you. Hello, Sheila uh, Gamble from Cambria. Would you care to comment on the Deco You should be right here, you. Yes, I think either near or further from you, I can't sure. Further away. Better? Further away, I think. Right, okay, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can, yeah, but it's blurred. Uh, I just wondered if you could comment on the Deco bears in Cumbria. I think you're the person who would comment on the Deco bear in Cumbria. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I mean, I would like to put a, an image of the Dacre bear in, um, but I, you know, I thought there wasn't time. But there are these uh, remarkable bears at Dacre in Cumbria, which are just standing bears. Um, there's two or, or three of them, isn't that right? Four of them. Thank you. And well, I did ask um, Professor Cramp last week, actually, when I was down visiting her what date do you give to these Dacre bears? And she says she thinks they must be early. She thought at one time they were later, but she thinks they must be 9th, 10th century. And they clearly are at a, a, Dacre was a very important religious site. So again, the association of these bears with a religious site is very interesting. And I think they must be performing some sort of protective role. But it's the bringing of these bears into the, into the Christian world, which is really so very, Exciting. More should be written about it. It's Thank not going to be me doing it. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is a great delight to have such a well-informed audience. I just wish we could go on with this discussion, but the format of these evenings is to move next to a, a formal lecture, and that starts at 7, and we're allowed a very short break before that. One thing I just mentioned, that is that there is on exhibition outside, lent to us by uh, the National Library of Scotland, there's an exhibition of three uh, m well, manuscripts, or they're poems by Catullus from 1495, uh, a copy obviously, and two different books of ours from the late 15th century. So do look out, they're on the left in, uh, in a case um, as you go out into the hall. Um, thank you very much indeed for your double performance. Well done, terrific. And thank you for those questions and comments. Committee, uh, whose sole job is to choose the rally lecturer each year. Well, it's always a pleasure, a personal pleasure, for me to come back to the land of my ancestors. But on this occasion, it's also a tremendous privilege and pleasure in professional terms. For this, this evening, signals more than one good thing. First, it continues cooperation between sister academies, between the British Academy, based in London, and the appropriately distinct Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is providing us with such a warm and wonderful welcome this evening, and I particularly would like to, to thank the President of the Royal Society, David Wilson, for, for giving us this welcome. Second, uh, this event inaugurates the clustering of four of the British Academy's uh, annual lectures this, uh, that are happening here. Uh, interspersed with a series of events organized by the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And third, it proclaims and celebrates as valuable the theme of all these lectures and events, which is medieval. That represents a decision, a choice, 
shared and collective, which at the present juncture cannot but be seen and heard as a credo and a speaking of truth to power. In the spring of 2003, when the new Labour cat of educational utilitarianism was already out of the bag, the then Minister of Education, Mr Charles Clark, in seeking the perfect example of an academic tribe that was perfectly useless <laughs> and ought not therefore to qualify for state funding, came up with ornamental medievalists. <laughs> now in the autumn of 2010, for sister academies to collude in showcasing medievalists, in showcasing the works of this tribe for a whole week must look less like a coincidence than an act of defiance. <laughs> so be it. And whenever you encounter the word medievalist, do, fund, do uh, mentally preface it with the word ornamental and feel a buzz of defiant irony. <laughs> The Raleigh Lecture in History is the highlight of the British Academy's calendar, certainly as far as historians are concerned. It's given triennially on uh, an even-handed uh, dispensation uh, every three years by a medievalist, early modern, modern, medieval. This year, we've struck lucky. It's the medieval year. Wholly appropriate that this year's rally lecture, lecturer should be a scholar who has chosen to spend the best part of his, her career so far in Scotland. First at St Andrews and more recently as the holder of the Edwards Chair in Medieval History at Glasgow. Julia Smith is an alumna successively of Cambridge and then of Oxford. First at Cambridge, where Rosamund McKittrick evoked her enthusiasm for early medieval European history, and then in doing a doctorate at Oxford with Michael Wallace Hadrill. Along with strong interests in the political and military, Julia's doctoral thesis on Brittany in the Carolingian Empire focused insistently and recurrently on religion not only on ecclesiastical structures and institutions, but, and this was rarer in the 1980s and 90s than it's since become, on religious belief and practice, as it were, on the ground, on popular religion. Her chapter in Volume 2 of the New Cambridge Medieval History in 1995 was concerned with... Um, the studying religion as lived by lay people particularly in the Carolingian world and is crammed with original insights. Meanwhile, by 1995, Julia had been teaching for some years in the United States of America, an experience that deepened and broadened her work, as for instance in her brilliant comparative essay regarding medievalists in the companion to historiography published in 1997. Julia's own alumni, accordingly, include some of the brightest and best younger American medievalists, as well as British ones. Her expanding interest in late antiquity produced, from the late 1990s onwards, several profound and original papers on Gregory of Tours, on Christian saints and saints' lives in the world of Gregory of Tours, and on the place of Rome in early medieval devotion. The culmination of that phase of her career was the yet deeper and broader Europe After Rome, published in 2005. By then, the cultural turn had inflected Julia's writing. And this is a book for students at all stages and all ages, and for a wider audience too. But it's also very much for the medievalists tribe themselves, more than one of whom have re reviewed this book in superlatives. And talking of reviewers, Julia writes the most thoughtful reviews of any colleague I know. 
reviewing is an underrated but vital academic genre, I think. Julia's very, very good at it. More recently, she's co-edited and contributed very substantially on her own account, first a path-breaking collection on early medieval gender and society, and more recently, uh, the, the uh, very large earlier medieval uh, volume of the Cambridge History of Christianity, which, and really this could not have happened much earlier, succeeds in kneading the yeast of cultural history into religious history to wondrously leavening effect. Most recently and currently, Julia has been researching early Christian martyr cults and um, developing her interest in gender history and finally and directly relevant to this evening's paper on relics. So I'm delighted now to invite Julia Smith to give in Edinburgh to this great city's Royal Society the 2010 Raleigh Lecture, Lecture in History, Portable Christianity, Relics in the Medieval West, circa 700 to 1200. Thank you.